what sort of routine do you have, if, if any, when you sit down to write? I generally get in the office about nine, 14 cups of tea, play solitaire, have a little scan around the web, I mean research, that kind of stuff. Start writing about 11, stop again at half 11, have another game of solitaire, another cup of tea. Now one o'clock I stop for lunch, start writing again at two after I've watched Loose Women in the News. Cup of tea, solitaire, might have a game of hearts. Four o'clock, I'm now thinking, shit, <laughs> I haven't done anything and I need to make a start. And then I'll write really quickly from four o'clock to six o'clock. And if I've done what I need to do that day, that's fine. And if I don't, then I'm there, I can be there at midnight. I might spend a day and never write down a word. And then I'll go to bed feeling a bit depressed and a bit worried. And I'll think, I really have to do something, you know. And then the second day I'll come along, I'll wake up still worried. And then I sit down at the computer um, and I think, because I'm so worried, I'll ease into it, and I um, start procrastinating again, and then another day passes and I still haven't done anything. Then the third day, or maybe the fourth, or maybe it's into the second week, I don't know, but, but, but at some point, um, I start having ideas, I start, I start panicking so much that I say, I better actually look at something. I look at things I find funny online, or, or, and I see, I see, is there anything I've seen recently that struck me as funny that I can use? I have a website, and I, I post up anything that I find funny. And one of the things I posted up was that, um, that guy who was accidentally interviewed on the BBC. Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by this uh, verdict today? I'm very surprised to see this verdict to, to come on, on me. And I thought, well, that would be a brilliant thing to happen to Moss. You know, <clears throat> so I had him brought on to the news and interviewed about Iraq by yeah. Percy War. Gavin Breyer is here with developments in North Korea. <laughs> it's five years since the war in Iraq began. The conflict rages on with no hope of a solution in sight. I'm joined by Stephen Premel, a spokesman for the Ministry of Defence. <laughs> Mr Premel. Hello. Hello. Uh, Iraq is a gigantic and bloody mess, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> So all these things that I'm procrastinating, I'm filling my time with, part of it is fear and not wanting to sit down and write, but the other part of it is feeding the subconscious. Because if you keep, start feeding the subconscious with stuff at that stage, it'll build up and build up and build up. And then finally, when you do have to write, you've hopefully built up a, a kind of store of stuff in your subconscious that you can draw from. It used to be uh, 10 hours a day non-stop. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, lunch breaks, tea breaks and stuff like that. But now I try to, it's quite hard. I get about three days in 10 to write and that's not enough time to finish the jobs I've got to do. So I've now employed people as part of a fire firewall team to make sure I sit down and do the writing. And of course I'm paying their wages to make, make sure I've got the space and the time. And I loathe them, I absolutely loathe them because you know, it's like telling me what to do. And I know I've got to pay them to do that, and I keep paying them, so they're doing something right. But um, <laughs> I have to be forced to sit down now. Yeah, we sort of do a one, 10 to 6, or basically that's our day, isn't it? The TV day. We do all the sort of storylining for, for episodes and together, and we sort of do a lot of detailed scene-by-scene -scene breakdowns of everything we write. And then we go away and we write the dialogue separately, and email each other chunks. Which is the most difficult bit, is it? The, the plotting is by far the hardest bit. It yeah. feels like that's the bit where you really need someone else in the room because you get an idea and it's no good and it's difficult to get to the next idea unless you've got someone else to, to bounce off. So it's I think... Like, on some level it's like engineering or building a table. It's just kind of making sure it all works and it can be quite um, exhausting. Starting without a, a story outline can really, can really hurt you. It's like eating a dessert and missing the main meal. But then that's just our experience. So there, there are writers who, who, who can do it, who sit down yeah. and sort of enjoy, oh, and I'll, get, I'll find out where I'm going. The bastards, we call them talented bastards. <laughs> I like the just free fall of, of just starting with a blank sheet of paper. Because what I do have before I start is generally I have a rough, in my head, a shape of the piece. And, and I'll absolutely know what the what the opening sequence is going to be. So I'll just start and I'll write that. Um, and I kind of know where I'm going, the kind of area, so I use that as a guide. With a show like Hustle, I have no idea, because the way that Hustle works is that it gets ever more complicated. It's a bit like um, 
painting yourself in a room, you know, painting the floor and end up in the corner. And I just do that, and I get to page 55, and I've now got 10 pages to explain how they got out of it in flashback, and at that point, I swear to you, I have no idea. I sort of work it out in my head, but not in order. So I haven't got scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four, scene five, and um, on paper at all. I've just got all these notions, some of which are weak and some of which are strong, and then as you're writing, and there's suddenly a weak one can become strong and a strong one can become weak, and you just follow it. It's like surfing it almost. Um, looks to me, what a daredevil. <laughs> what an adventurous man. Um, but it is, it's like you just sort of slalom your way through it and see what's working and what doesn't. I come up with a, a plot structure that I know will get me to a, through a first draft. I, I, I come up with a plot structure that, that just says, right, that, that will happen there and that will happen there and this will probably happen at the end. I can write this now. And, you know, I use that to get through the first draft, but, but the, I see the first draft as a... Um, I see the first draft as toilet paper, basically. You know, I mean, the first draft to me is just a bunch of notes. I love things that, a funny image that are, like one thing that struck me as funny recently, I may well be proved wrong, is uh, it's the idea of, of Roy with no shirt on in the office. For some reason, Roy walking around the upstairs area with no shirt on really made me, I just thought, that's, that's funny. You know, that's a funny image. And, and then I just started, how can I engineer that? How can I make that happen? And what are the ramifications? I usually try and build a plot from, from those kind of moments, those kind of moments that aren't satire, they aren't, um, uh, they aren't uh, explainable. In, in, you can't say, well, this is that, this is a parody of such and such. It's usually things that are like, as I say, born from the subconscious and are, are more interesting because they're kind of dreamlike in a weird way, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The state of play, I knew it wasn't a political thriller, it's just a story about you know, two characters, one of whom happens to be a politician. And I know it was more defined as a political structure by the time I'd written it, but I didn't storyline that at all. I started typing and I got ten pages in and going, oh my god, oh my god, he's dead. Sonia's dead. She's dead. What's going on here? And you go, well, you better work it out because you're getting paid to do it. And I love that. I love turning corners without seeing the bends. So you don't sort of sit there with index cards working out... I, I've had to, in the last two weeks, I had to, because there was a time imperative on the script. But, uh, yeah, I like not knowing where I'm going to end up. Uh, you know, kind of taking a leap, but not knowing where you're going to land is really... It's a really respectable way to write. Do you ever find that you've painted yourself into a corner? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I love... Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a multiple split personality in a really healthy occupational way where you're going, oh, you think I can't get out of this one? I think I can't. And I have to talk to myself like that all the time, going, yeah, yeah, bet you can't, bet you can't. And, and it is professional petulance. And, uh, and I love proving that I can when the odds are against me. Queer as Folk was like... Queer as Folk was a nightmare cos it was just this... You know, right about gayness. So it was like, yeah, there's the whole world. That was like too bad. I spent a long time walking around in a proper old panic about that because it was just too wide. It was like, it's like it seemed to be right about everything. I was like, where do you start? And then I just met these two people. I was like clubbing in Manchester and I met these two people, one of whom was just two best friends, and one of whom was just completely in love with the other. And the other knowing it but never recognizing it. And they'd been best friends for like 10 years and they were both suffocating each other. And I just thought, oh, that's it. Oh, my God. Vince, hard on. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> I didn't know you cared. Oh, no one's looking. Go on, get it out, get it out. Oh, oh. six months since I've had a shag. It's like Pavlov's dogs. <laughs> you sad bastard. And I really, I thought that's it, because I've done that myself so many times, stuff like that, unrequited love, being the chimp at the side who just... The more who's pain. Just, oh, the more pain, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, it just, I just thought, oh, there's a story. That's, if you talk, if you write about the gay world, that's a story I could use to pull myself through like a guide rope and, and get my way through it. So it tends to start with just one thing and then you see if that echoes. And that, I mean, that sort of leads us on to characters. So there, you, that's an example of, of you kind of plucking some characters from real life. But if you're, if you're in a, mm. a situation where you're having to invent a, a new companion for the Doctor or something, yeah, where yeah. do you start with that? It's a terrible answer to that, cos it's just... It's just instinct. I just sit down and start writing them, and that's what I'm good at. I am good at that, and and I don't sit there with a pa 
bad demographics and, and things like that, saying, oh, she must be this, she must be that. I just think, I just know her. Just Rose Tyler, I just know her. I just know from the moment they asked me to do Doctor Who, I knew what the companion like, would be like, I knew where she's from. And that's a very specific, it's a very iconic character in a way, but that's it. I'm like that with, I know some people sit down and draw up lists of where, they went to, where these characters went to school and what knickers they wear and what they have for breakfast and do they smoke or not, and I don't do any of that. It's like, it's just, it's why I'm a writer. I can imagine characters and I can imagine their voices and I'm good at writing their voices as they would sound and it just comes out. I think that's to be something that you have to recognise something of yourself in there. There's got to be that empathy. I kind of bring different aspects together of people that I know or people that I've met and I kind of mix and match. It's almost like Mr Potato Head. What you add to that then is a research. Um, and in the case of Hustle, you come out with the character of Mickey Bricks. I, uh, you know, I had a mate who was effortlessly cool. You know those that I could never do. You know, I always stub my toe when I go to the bar. The door always closes in my face. It doesn't happen to me. I've got this friend. It's ridiculous. He doesn't even walk. He's on wheels. He just glides. Sorry to have kept you good people waiting. Traffic was awful. <laughs> <laughs>